Thank you, Uli. Thank you, Kshishev, to be with us tonight in this room, English, English room where you spoke once, 12 years ago, about your experiences in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And for all of you who came here tonight and the other one who see the video, just a little overview of this next hour. Uh, Krzysztof will present us with some pictures, with some words, a kind of introduction about uh, Oswiecim Auschwitz-Birkenau as this historical place of mass murdering gas chambers and extermination. And after this introduction that we get a certain common first approach that we can share all together, I will go on and about 15 minutes tell you about these um, excursions, as Uli Hota said, we do regularly with the students. Why we go there and what kind of experiences we had, kind of introduction. And then it's going back to Krzysztof Antonczyk with the question why he is working there. So about his inner motivation to be on this place. I know him since more than 30 years and I visited him since his beginnings as a scientific co-worker in 1995, my first arrival there. He started in 1994, and since 2008, we are there regularly with students. So then the question comes back to him about his inner motivation. So long time to be there on the place, to meet the people coming, to meet the survivors, but also to see every day history or past or present and partly also future because the genocidal uh, epoch of humanity is not completely over in many other parts of the world but in a very different way we see the abyss. So the question will be to him to explain us a little bit uh, about his inner position there. And then in the last quarter of an hour, last 15 minutes, I have some questions to him and this is the more the conversation, but I hope that we have a conversation all the time because we are in a form of dialogue since 30 years and this was also the reason why we selected the English language tonight. Then it's possible for Krzysztof to listen to each word and also we want to, to reach people really outside Germany and outside the boundaries. So I would say, Krzysztof, now it would be the time to show us some pictures, to tell us some words, just as the first approach to Auschwitz-Birkenau, Auschwitz-Birkenau, in the past and in the present. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you in that pandemic way, online, so in 2012, uh, I've been the first time alive, and now I'm just on the screen, but I feel your presence. I wanted to share my experiences from my work in Auschwitz Memorial Site, which was built in 1947, two years after the liberation of the biggest concentration camp and the death camp, Auschwitz-Birkenau, the biggest concentration camp and the death camp uh, set up by uh, Nazi Germany in occupied Poland. That was the whole network, of course, of the concentration camps. Uh, Auschwitz was unique because it was the biggest. And that was compilation of the concentration camp and, and, and the death camp. In uh, other death uh, camps, Vernichtungslager, Beuzet, Srobinka, Sobibur, they just used to kill 100% without any selection, so there are no prisoners. In Auschwitz, we have both. We have prisoners, we had prisoners, and we had victims who just spent two, three, four hours after their arrival to Auschwitz and before their death. So that's, that's a tragic that most of victims were, were no prisoners. They just were deported in many countries of Europe, People who were born in all continents, in fact, and more than 900,000 people uh, were murdered in the complex without any registration, without any signs, without any traces. Uh, 400,000 people were registered as inmates, 
and for some of them we have the information about their identity but it's also some of the tragedy still now that we don't have the identities of all of, of the victims the victims from uh, more than 30 countries of Europe, mostly Jewish people, more than 90%, 90% they are Jewish people, but they're also Poles, Cindy and Roma, Soviet prisons of war, Jehovah Witnesses and um, political prisoners from many countries. Here we can see an aerial photograph from 1944, uh, where you can see the whole complex because Auschwitz was a complex of more, more than 40 camps, Auschwitz one. Uh, here you can see so-called Stammlager with 30 barracks. That was the beginning. That was the beginning of the concentration camp. Uh, here you can see below Auschwitz one, and the biggest uh, part was Auschwitz two Birkenau, where uh, they built more than 300 barracks. But what is the most important? They built also four huge crematoria. And the gas chambers uh, where people were deported and killed. Their free unloading ramps where millions of, uh, where hundreds of thousands of, of people were, were deported. And after the selection, here you can see in the middle of the photograph, there is an unloading ramp. And after the selection, usually 90, 80% of new arrivals were sent to death and they just were murdered in the gas chambers where you used Cyclone B to kill them. Later bodies were plundered. I mean, they cut off women's hair. Uh, that was done by Zonderkommando prisoners, prisoners who were forced to assist in this process of killing. And uh, the bodies were cremated. Ashes were spread around the crematoria. They also dump the ashes into the rivers and uh, ponds or they just strength the roads using the ashes. So the practical thing. Uh, the third part was Auschwitz Fremonovic, so-called Buna, where prisoners uh, built the whole factory for concern, for German concern, IG Farben industry. Uh, if you know Primo Levi, maybe, or Eli Bizet, they both were imprisoned in Auschwitz Fremonovic. And uh, so-called interesting Gebiet be the Skyl Auschwitz. So I, I, I've mentioned that was a huge complex of many camps and sections. Here you can see 40 square kilometers of the isolated zone from the outside world, where uh, these main parts of the complex were uh, located and also subcamps with the factories where people were employed, the prisoners were employed. Most of documentation uh, SS destroyed before liberation. So now we have only 5% of the documentation. That's why it's so difficult for us to uh, collect uh, the identities of the victims. Most of the documentation was uh, destroyed or lost. After the war in 1947, the museum was established on the site. In fact, that was done by prisoners who survived. So the museum was established by the people who were the victims of this, of this camp. We have the artifacts, we have the documents, like suitcases with the names. We are trying to collect each single document uh, to collect the names in every possible, on every possible site. So here you can see the uh, Abram Zendrovich, uh, the suitcase, and here you can see his, his two gangs listed, where you can see uh, Abram Zandrovich with his uh, two uh, sons who were deported, Polish Jews who were deported to Auschwitz. Here you can see some examples of the documents. Luck Lucky survived because in most cases we don't have a trace about the whole families, the whole generations. Uh, so that's, this is so-called Leichenhalle where you can see only the number, prisoner's number, no name. So usually Mm, they use SS use numbers, not names. So that's why it's so difficult also uh, because we have the documentation with numbers only without any names. And here I can see um, one of the purpose why I'm in, in Auschwitz. Uh, the photograph I had before, civilian photograph and the photograph I found in, the, in our resources. Uh, 
So the survivors are very important for uh, the beginning of the museum, but they're also very important for, uh, for me as an as a employee because they gave me the sense of being in, in such a place. Because normally we could think Auschwitz is a, is a place of horror, it's a place of tragedy. But now, later, I will, I will show you that in my opinion, in my sense, uh, that was kind of the conversion from the evil and tragedy to the uh, goodwill people place and the place which concentrate such a people like, like Peter Zelk and uh, many others who want to build uh, the new world based on this tragedy. So we are all very sorry. It's, it's, it's a biggest tragedy in one of the biggest tragedy in the humankind. But now we can convert this tragedy. This is what we can do only to remember, to, to build the commemoration and to build the, the better future. So maybe that's just for the beginning, just I wanted to show you the, the background, the memorial site and the short inscription of the history of the site. Mm, and now I give uh, my voice to, to Petr again. To start also with a personal report, I visited Krzysztof Antonczyk in the winter time. It was 1995 uh, uh, till 96, and at this time he was living inside the camp as a young co-worker, scientific co-worker, and he lived in an SS building. So in the middle of, of the camp, and it was snowing, it was December or January, I can't remember, uh, this very cold Polish winter time, and we were in the camp, uh, night and day, and uh, there was almost no tourism. And I mean, there were no prisoners anymore, but maybe invisible. It was extremely dense, this experience, uh, and I thought how, how he will survive there. It was, it was just a start, the starting point of his scientific co-workership. He went there to do a, a, a PhD, a scientific degree in history, and by accident or by destiny, he came to this place. And um, I, when I wanted to see him there. I, I saw him before during his studies in Krakow. But so we had common interests, let's say um, art history of the very old time. But then he was, by his academic way, suddenly in Auschwitz-Birkenau, and I've never been there. And I've been to a German school, a gymnasium, where we never really, never really had as a studying object uh, the German Nazi time. At school in the 80s, I learned nothing about the world of the concentration and, and determination camp, extermination camps. And I, I visited him there, inwardly full of guilt as a soul atmosphere, even if I'm born in 63. And since then, I came back to him. First interest to see him on the place and his inner development there, and, but also by my visits, deeper and deeper, a connection to the place. And later on, I decided this should be a, an awareness of every human being. And because I had to do with students, especially for medicine, I invited them to go with me. First for a kind of, yes, historical awareness, conscience. I mean, St. John's time, as Dr. Steiner described this very special moment in the year we are approaching now is a time of historical conscience. And in a certain way it was clear there is a reason just to go there, to be there, to, to experience such a place, and to commemorate the death, and to see, to be there with open eyes and ears. It is the biggest graveyard of the world, and yeah, an extraordinary place. 
And in a certain way, it made sense just to go there. But later on, I realized that there is one profession, there are some, but there is one profession who was extremely important in Auschwitz in the process of extermination, selection and extermination, were the doctors, the German SS doctors. So Hitler and his colleagues thought that medicine is essentially to transform uh, a society into a biopolitical society. And you all know they, they had these racial and genetic thoughts and dogmatic thinkings, and they wanted to select the life which is worth to live and the other one. And what they needed were the medicines to select and to judge what is necessary. And I realized later on in my life that Hufeland was right, the doctor of Goethe and Schiller, who said in, 19, in, 1806, in 1806 that uh, a doctor can be the most dangerous man in the state if the doctors believe that they have the right to judge which life is worthy to live and which is not. It was in 1806. He was a kind of a prophetic approach to the 20th century where biopolitics uh, was getting one, one of the most difficult paradigmas in history, most dangerous. And I didn't, do, I didn't want to warn the, the medical students, but to get a, an awareness of the role of medicine in society. In, in Germany, you probably know, we had a kind of a trial after the war, Nürnberger Ärzte Prozess, and they were brought, the doctors who survived and, and worked for the SS, and, and in, in this whole uh, process of, of murdering, um, they, were, they, were, they had to come to court, and, and, but the end result, I shortened it very much, was that they were not all just criminals and, and demons, but in a certain way they were serving the state as, as, as trained doctors, but they learned during their studies what they need is to objectivate human beings into objects, yes. To, to this kind of materialistic approach to medicine, that it's a physical body and with worth to lie or not. I mean, it's depending on the genetics and on the race. They were teached. It was a kind of their teaching that they had this role. And I would say a professional tr transformation or deformation in, in, in the medical training. They had no real image of man by their medical studies in the time, in the Nazi time, but it started before with this materialistic approach to medicine. They were almost prepared to function in that way. And they lost ethic, I would say, in medicine. Medicine was transformed in a kind of practical natural science. I mean, the physical body is an object of natural science, and soul and spirit are not really relevant. So in a certain way, it was from my opinion, but it's not only my own. Uh, of course, it was a, a Nazi, dict such a system with this power of evil, but it was working together with a, a type of medicine who lost the image of what is a human being. And in so far, they fitted together. And I think this is an, very important for every medical student to understand that medicine is not a free sphere. There are forces working in, can be political forces as in that time, economic forces very strong in our time, but also forces of administration, registration, overview. I mean, we all know Snowden. We are living in a world of control. And the biopolitical control is one of the most dangerous. That was Mitchell said, Mitchell who wrote the book about the Nuremberg doctor's trial, he, he, he stated that, that in, in, in the late 1940s that biopolitics uh, is getting one of the most difficult challenges of the future. And I wanted that the students 
understand that they have a wonderful uh, uh, option to, to becoming a doctor, but they should be aware that, that medicine is not just a free ground, a free sphere, and that we need our standing in, in the field of medicine and uh, with, uh, should be awake of what is going around us. So, but not only a kind of a, a consciousness and awareness, but also a kind of a schooling path. I would say that in the medical studi studies, but also I think in, every, in all other studies, we need a kind of a schooling path to realize the other one and not to transform him to a physical object or a psychological object too. We need a kind of a schooling approach to the sphere in between I and you, as Martin Buber put it. And so in Wittenherdecke, where I'm teaching, or in Alanus, we try to not only to bring inputs, inputs to the kind of a consciousness, but also to how to train this kind of awareness for the other one. Uh, two little points, also important, other little points to go there. I wanted to, that the students also see there was resistance there. There was not only uh, a system perfectly killing people, but there was all the time inner resistance, and also in the field of medicine, but not in the SS realm, but under the Jewish doctors and the Jewish nurses and the Jewish midwives and the Polish midwives as well. So the prisoners, the prisoners helped each other. And that's a, a wonderful topic to study there. And Krzysztof and his colleague, they tell us the stories and bring the material that under these horrible conditions, these Jewish doctors and, as I said, nurses and midwives, they did whatever they could to save the life of the other one. And also the Polish prisoners, they did whatever they could. And we, we studied this in detail as far as it's still possible. And it is some, sometimes deeply impressing if we, we leave Auschwitz, and, and I asked this the medical students, they're not all medical, other study psychology or philosophy, but if I asked the medical students, or also psychology, I asked what, what is for you maybe the possible outcome of this excursion, a lot of them said I, I regained my strong will to heal or to cure or to support or to help. That means they come back not with the main uh, experience of having been in a most depressive place. Now being there and confronting the abyss, they also met other forces, maybe as a kind of a, a reaction inside, but also by these by this persons Krzysztof and his colleagues show us, they tell us. And this is the last point I wanted to mention. Um, and Krzysztof just mentioned it a little bit with these last photographs. Um, it was a place to, to kill, I mean, to kill by work or to kill by the gas chamber, and also a, a place to kill the identity of human beings. In a, in a certain way, one of the Nazi intentions was to kill the identity, to make them all the same physical masses and then they'll die. So they, they, were, they had no more name, they had a number, and they lost their biography, their memory partly. And what we experienced in going to this place and to meet Krzysztof and the co-workers there, they try whatever they can do to bring the identity back to the victims. In a lot of cases, it's no more possible because there are no traces. But if there are some traces, there is enormous activity in yeah, trying to reconstruct the biography. These are not only gypsies, Sintis, and Romas. No, they all had their life and their past and their face and their history. So we have then seminars with Krzysztof and the colleagues. And this is deeply impressive for all students, impressive and also for me, of course, is they try to give them their identity back. Trout a page, a survivor of the White Rose group, once said in a conference in, in America, 
about medicine after the Holocaust, she said, it is a beautiful thing that we can do, give people a name and place. Give people a name and place. Um, you know Yad Vashem, a name, Hand und Namen. It is hand and name. Um, not just to commemorate in general, in abstract, but concrete. And the name, yeah. also the holy name, belongs to this theme. And where is the link to medicine? If you study this approach on such a place of evil, by those who are working there now, it was a huge image, or it's, it's creating a huge image for the students if it's possible there, under these circumstances. We will, of course, practice it wherever we live now. So this concentration that a human being is unique and the most precious thing on, on the earth, every human being, be and all racial, national thinking, a human being. What is a human being? And in a, in a way, for, for them, they say it is an excursion approaching the mystery of the human being on a place which is the most destructive place I know on earth for the mystery of what is a human being. So uh, it's maybe a little bit too much what I said now, but I wanted to, to, to explain that for, for many of the students, they afterwards they said it was deeply, it was horrible, of course, we, all these stories and to stand on the ground and to see the gas chamber. So over days and nights, they can't sleep there and it's a deep process, but at the end we try that there is also light and and now I come back to Krzysztof. This has a many to, had many to do with him and his colleagues. There is a team of people who are historians, but they are not only knowing about facts and dates. The students realize they have a special relationship to the place and to the individualities, to the names, and they have a kind of an ethic and ethic values on a place, on a ground, where all human values were destroyed, almost all human values. I mentioned the resistance movement, uh, they had human values. So I want to come back to Krzysztof, and uh, yes, uh, all these excursions are not possible with hi without him and his team. And in so far now, for him a little bit more to explain his inner motivation to stand there since 30 years or almost um, and to work there. Um, Krzysztof, can you tell us a little bit about your inner development there, some of your experiences there, and then we'll come to this part with some questions. This would be now for you the next section okay okay yes of course um i'll show you again some some pictures and uh, because uh, i want to show you some some people uh the people who are in auschwitz as a prisoners but they are also people goodwill people who uh, visited uh, the site for all these years that i have been employed in in auschwitz so now, uh, that was kind of the evolution for me, because uh, to start my work, I was completely not aware about uh, my ideas, uh, in fact, how I would be possible to, to work there. And uh, I discovered later that uh, now this site is kind of the conversion, uh, that we had a network of the concentration camps built by Nazi Germany uh, the network of hatred, of, of disaster, of uh, tragedy, and uh, um, ruled by the people who are obsessed by uh, Nazism. Uh, and uh, now we have the 
network of the organizations or the institutions of the people who are goodwill people who want to do something, who want to change uh, the world, building the new world on this uh, tragedy. Uh, so that's, that's uh, fascinating uh, that the history of Auschwitz, of the concentration camp system, of the disaster of the Second World War could be converted into, into the future for, for all of us. So it's not only the past of the history, but it's very alive still in our, uh, in our lives. Dehumanization, rehumanization, uh, this uh, uh, kind of the evolution was for me, uh, there are some important people for me, like uh, Dr. Hubert Schneider from Bochum University, who organized the first meeting of German and Polish students on the site of Auschwitz-Birkenau, where I've met uh, Peter Zelk and his wife, Julia. And that was uh, a fascinating way we had together since the communist collapse later through the changes in the Eastern Bloc. And now we have this pandemic time, which is also kind of the challenge for us. Uh, so as Peter told that we know each other for many years. Uh, another important person for me, Professor Wacław Długoborski, who was not only my promoter of my, of my dis dissertation, but he was also employed in historical department of Auschwitz Memorial. And he was the former prisoner as a 17 years old uh, boy. He was uh, arrested and deported to Auschwitz as a political prisoner. He's still alive. He's uh, more than over 90 years old now, and he's still very, very active. They showed me, uh, he, he was such a person who uh, showed me Auschwitz uh, in another way, as a, as a place of the present time, as a place of the uh, conversion into, into the future, our, our uh, uh, tragic history. So many survivors, they used to meet uh, uh, young people, audience, they used to tell their stories, stories of their lives. Each story is kind of the individual story. So we have biographies, we have personal accounts, we have testimonies wrote by former prisoners who survived, also about those who perished, who, who were murdered. And uh, it's a very important process. So now we can see that uh, nearly all they are gone. There are some few persons who are still alive. And now we are like another generation of those who should uh, teach the world and should show the, to the world this tragic past, thinking about this, what I told you before, this conversion into the better future. Uh, also, my first boss, Dr. Francis Pieper, who uh, made the research concerning the real number of victims because of so many gaps in the sources of documentation, we are not aware about the real number of the killed people in, in Auschwitz. Or maybe numbers are not really important here. Uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Romuald Staba, who was also the prisoner, that was one of my first uh, case in my work to, to trace uh, the fa fates of his colleagues in the camp because he survived. Uh, and uh, Peter mentioned Yad Vashem, the chief of the Hall of Names, Alex Avraham, Avram, uh, who for many years have been trying to collect six million of Jewish identities of those Jewish lives who were lost in the Holocaust. Now they are able to, uh, they already found nearly five million of identities, which is uh, amazing. And, and also another important person for me, uh, Romuald Jakob Wexler Vashkinel, two names, two first names, two family names, because he was adopted by Polish family. And now he's employed in, in, in Yad Vashem. He was the uh, Catholic priest, not being aware that he's, uh, he's a Jewish boy. So in age of 32, he discovered that he's a Jewish man, that his family was parched in, in the ghetto and he was adopted by the Polish family. 
So here you can see him uh, in Yad Vashem with Oksana Karol. She comes from St. Petersburg and they build a new life in Israel with a whole family. So these are unique uh, networks of, of cooperation now, uh, of friendships that we have built just because of, of Auschwitz tragedy and uh, built just because we all want to do something uh, good, believing that uh, these people who perished, these people who were murdered, were full of love and hope. They are missing their families, they are missing their children, they are missing their wives, parents. And we had, of course, in, in Auschwitz, in the camp, both on both sides, uh, ugliness and beauty, uh, degeneration and human values, despair and hope, hate and love, ego egoism and solidarity. That all was present, but uh, I strongly believe that uh, these people who are the victims were not the first, uh, they were not full of hatred, they are full of, of, uh, of uh, love and, and hope. So uh, here, another uh, example, Lloyd Harala from Canada, First Nation uh, of, of America, one of Indian tribe who found the symbol in Auschwitz to his people. And uh, so now, of course, Auschwitz this is a symbol for, for the whole humankind and for many tragedies happening still in the world. Uh, so this is my, my child, my daughter, who got the Indian name from him, Wabanekwa. And here we've met after some years. He makes some praying using the tobacco. So here you can see the photograph, the tobacco tied in the materials with the colors, materials symbolizing different uh, powers in the world, according to the beliefs of, of First Nation. Or Simon, Simon Watson, the photographer who wanted to find the conversion of the interiors of the former camp. So he made a huge photographs uh, of the interiors, empty interiors with ling lingering presence. He wanted to show that these interiors are still full of uh, inner life of the memories. And uh, this is like uh, the windows to the past, the, the windows to the memories. So we had like a whole, uh, mm, exhibition of his art, of his photographs, with the colorful wall, uh, walls of uh, Auschwitz I Stammlager interiors. Like this, uh, for example, this cloud he called, uh, th this room he called cloud rooms, clouds room, because you can see kind of clouds on the blue uh, blue wall. I've, I told him that these clouds were made by three layer banks, by the people who by the prisoners who spent their nights sleeping on three, on three layer wooden banks in Auschwitz. So that's, that's that incredible uh, meanings that we can find everywhere on this uh, original site. So here you can see this, these photographs being like, the, like, uh, like a windows to the interior world. And the first prisoner, number 31, the first 30 prisoners were, were uh, 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 couples were uh, criminal prisoners from Sachsenhausen who were deported together with the SS to organize a camp. Here you can see the first political prisoner, number 31, who managed to survive the camp. I've met him uh, many years later. So that was incredible to talk to him, to to hear his story, the story of the young boy, the pupil who was imprisoned in such a place. Uh, another young boy at that time, Marian Stykowski, who was employed, who was uh, in so-called Maurer Schule, where they used to make the, to, to learn how to make the plasters on the walls. 
or Vol Zelmanovich that I found him just because of this brick where uh, outside of block number seven in Auschwitz one, we found the name Zelmanovich, Wolf Zelmanovich, Kovartbrike by Posen and his number 143745, the prison's number. Uh, by internet, I was able to find him and uh, I was able to talk to him. This is only what we have, the brick and his name. Or Harina Birenbaum, who is the author of the uh, incredible book with, his, with, his, uh, with her uh, accounts, The Hoffnung Stirb Zuletzt, the story of her life. He also, he, she's still alive and she used to meet still the young people uh, where during these meetings she used to, to tell their story to, to them. So recently I discovered that we can uh, describe the, the, the phenom phenomenon of, of Auschwitz as a, as a historical site, as a, a fact that happened in human history, uh, and we can compare it to the tree that the, the roots of this tree, this is the roots of xenophobia, of antisemitism, of hatred. These roots, uh, in the result of, of all these uh, roots, we had the, the trunk, the, the, the tree of, of the disaster of, of Auschwitz. And now we can compare the sites now, after the liberation, after the disaster, to to describe it to the crown of the tree with all the branches, limes. And I think that we all can be such a branches of this tree. So we have a chance, we have a unique chance to convert this tragedy of huma humanity into the, the better future. And it's important for, I think for all of us now and, and uh, for our generation, but also for, for future generations. So I think that uh, famous uh, quotation of Theodor Adorno that uh, writing the poems after Auschwitz is barbaric. In some way, I think uh, I don't uh, share this opinion because I, I think that that was a tragedy uh, for all humankind, for, for Jewish people, for Europe, for Western civilization. But now that's my strong belief that we can do something good on this soil. Uh, otherwise, I think I, I would not have a um, point to, to be here and to, to work here for all these years. That's my power that gives me my, my, this power that and these experiences that I have to the German students of medicine, for example, or to many other people from the whole world, from many cultures, from many religions, gives me this uh, strong belief that it's really true, that uh, this is a place of hope and love now, not hatred and, and, and not only the tragedy. Yes. Yeah, so I think that that's uh, enough for now. Maybe we can go back to, to Peter and maybe he has some ideas, some questions, maybe something what you'd like to add because we're sharing the, the in fact, the, the same opinions for all these years and we are supporting each other, I think. And it's very important for me that I have Peter with me for all these years. In some way, we are in kind of the union, which is uh, kind of the cooperation and kind of a symbiosis. <laughs> uh, so in some way, he also uh, is present in my life very deep. Dziękuję bardzo, Krzyszek. Um, I mean, I think everybody who listened to him can imagine to be there three or four days to hear him, to see the stories, to see the walls, but also his friends worldwide, 
all religions. I mean, Christoph is quite often to Israel and very well known in Yad Vashem and many Jewish friends. But also you saw the picture from somebody who came from the Canada from the First Nations and brought a tobacco to do a ritual there on the place. He, the man who never lost somebody as a relative there, but came from Canada uh, from the First Nations with a strong feeling that this is a place on earth, Auschwitz-Birkenau, which has to be cured, so balanced. Uh, because evil was so destructive there that it had to be balanced on, on different levels. So balanced by those who come and think on their fathers and mothers and grandfathers and aunts and, and other, they have no connections, but they come also there. And the man who came from Canada, he wanted to do the ritual but he got a friend of Christoph and Hanschik, and at the end he gave the holy name to his youngest daughter. And so a network, as he said. And I don't know the average time, Christoph, before it was closed, but it was, if I have it correctly in my mind, more than a million people a year. That means, yeah, we have these huge numbers of people who died in Auschwitz-Birkenau, and we have this huge number of people who come there. And of course, there is a part, there is tourism also, and they are there for two hours. But others are there longer. But you, and even if you are only there for half an hour, but really there, it's not a question of extension of time. And you can see there are people praying, and yeah, in all religions. and. So I want to ask Krzysztof how it is if Auschwitz is closed, Auschwitz-Birkenau. I always had a feeling it is not balanced, but all the positive forces brought to the place, they never can really balance what happened there. But it is an impact that all those people come with their different religions and images of men, and then it was closed. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the corona time, what happens to such a place if people don't come anymore? It, yeah, maybe a little bit about this change, society in change, but also such a place in change. And now maybe you have more virtual programs there, but all the time we came to Auschwitz to be physically there, and I had a feeling there is a strong limit of virtualization. You have to be there, but now they could not come anymore. So maybe yeah, so some words about this time, Krzysztof. Yeah, of course. So the, the last year was very difficult for, for all of us and also on this field of the commemoration, that was a bit difficult time. Uh, we got to use that every year. We had uh, one, two million of people coming to, as a visitors. And as Peter mentioned, that was partly a touristic site, which was not helping uh, such deep groups coming, wanted to have some peaceful time. Now it's very peaceful in Auschwitz, uh, in the former camp, because uh, we had uh, the closed museum for many months. Now, since uh, last uh, Tuesday, the museum is all the time open again. And we have the first visitors, individual people. Uh, there are not so many groups because uh, that's not possible to organize uh, the kind of the excursions anywhere. There are not many uh, foreigner groups. These are mostly Polish people uh, because it's still difficult to cross the, the borders. Uh, for all these years after the liberation, when the museum was uh, set up, the most important was the fact that this is the original site. This is the real site. And it's in, we rather try to avoid any form of virtualization. Uh, but now we are forced in some way by the present state, by the pandemic situation, to build some tools for uh, virtual tours. So we build uh, the special program with virtual vir reality of Birkenau in 1944, 
which will be possible uh, to be entered by the people from all around the world. But of course, still we want to underline very strong that uh, the most important is to visit on in original place because uh, we have such a places like Yad Vashem, we have such a places like uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington DC where we have original objects, even artifacts belong to the deported people. But in fact, uh, this is not the original site. So that's the power of uh, original soil. Just if you, if you stand on the, on the site of Birkenau, if you stand nearby the gas chamber, it can be replaced by any virtual reality, of course. But I think we want to find the chance now in this uh, new tools, in this new situation, to make, to spread the uh, knowledge about uh, Auschwitz uh, memorial site around the world to such uh, places in the world which are so far away that for those people probably it could be not possible to really to come to us, even for the borders are open again, even for the pandemic uh, will go away. So I think that uh, we try to, to use this uh, opportunity now to build these tools and to be also more open to this uh, virtual technology. But still, uh, we want to, to be focused on the real visits. And uh, I think that people share our opinion because even for the museum was closed, Still, there are some people, we could see some people coming to the museum, going around the fences and trying to, sh to see anything from the outside. So that was incredible to see how strong is the will in the people to visit this site. Because of course, it's not, it's called a museum, but in fact, first of all, it's a, it's a memorial site. And first of all, it's a, a huge mass grave with uh, and people have a uh, mm, they are aware about this and they have a right to to come to this site not only for the visit but just for commemoration thank you yeah and it's said that we can now we haven't seen to to better for more than one year, we have to cancel two of, of, of our visits of our programs, and we are waiting for the for the better future in, with this. And I think it, it can be replaced by, of course, this kind of a conference that we have now of the lectures. It's it's very good opportunity, but of course, we don't want to lead the people without possibility to come to the, to the real site. Thank you. It's not easy to find the right question because it's such, um, how to say, a full description. I think that all of you who listened get a certain taste also for the experiences of the students or the visitors. Krzysztof is no survivor but he knows a lot of the survivors and now <clears throat> the last of them they die and um, it was always deeply impressive when Krzysztof brought a survivor as Professor Lugoborsku to, to all of us and I always remember one night we had a long discussion night with uh, Professor Lugoborski, he didn't want to stop and it was, the students were all tired. It was uh, until midnight and he was drinking red wine and he wanted to talk more with this life joy and students couldn't anymore. He was 85 or 86. So finally we brought him home by a car, Christoph's car, and I had never, no clue where he is living. Uh, and in the night we brought him to the camp. And in fact, he was sleeping there. He had a room there. And I always saw this old man passing the gas chamber and going to his room. And in a certain way, it was a symbol um, for a kind of a, of a force of, 
overcoming, of course, more or less by accident. I mean, he survived, he lived over four years in, in Birkenau and he survived and almost all other died. But he survived and then he came back and he was teaching to the students. And I wanted just to say that Krzysztof came close to the survivors and now the students are very happy that he is there and in a certain way it's, it's going on to the future. This kind of transformation, a historical place with all those who died and those who survived, a small group, but they brought a huge impact to, to found a museum, but not as a museum, but as a teaching place. Uh, Primo Levi or Hermann Langbein or all the others, they had, they had the idea that it's, it's, it's a schooling place. It's hard to say because it's in a certain way that's just evil. But I think we got a, a taste of uh, how hum, human forces are working there still today. And in so far, we are always full of gratitude if we leave the place that they are working there. And so we hope that it will be open soon um, and the people can come. Yes, I have no real final question, Krzysztof, I realized. I had some on the paper, but in fact, yeah, questions, I don't know. Uh, just just yeah. to come to close, I, I wanted to add that uh, I would like to invite you to come to, to, to our memorial, memorial because uh, I strongly believe that it's important for all of us to be not at least one time in, in such a place, in this place, but by visiting each stage of, of your life, you can discover some new, some new things, because we as a, as a young boys, as a students, together with Peter, I think we could see this history, this, uh, this tragedy in some other way, uh, in comparison to the state of our minds as uh, fathers, as, uh, as uh, husbands. So I could imagine that to be an old man, to come to such a place, you can discover something else. So it's kind of the pilgrimage. And uh, it could be, normally you could imagine it could be strange to invite anyone to come to such a place, but uh, I really believe that it, it makes sense for all of us because it, it could give us a new Mm, new prospect, uh, like for those students of medicine, they, they found the, the power to, to act, they found the power to be the doctors, they found the, the way to be the, the doctors in, in our present time. So that's why I think that's not only the history, but it's still present with us. And it, it could give us some power, in fact, so uh, we can imagine some people who experience some accidents, for example, sometimes they are stronger after. I, I hope that humanity could be stronger also after in the sense of uh, humanity, which is built uh, on human values, on hope, on beauty, love and solidarity. Closing words, I think there is nothing more to add as you brought it. Yeah. In the past, national identities, they had their memorial places, big victories, places where national identity um, was positive fighting against other na nations. But nowadays, maybe we knew the kind, need a kind of a new identity as a dramatized um, humanity, you called it accidents. I mean, major accidents. But these can be really also organs for a transformation. And in so far, our gratitude that people as you work there for this transformation, because without human beings, there is no transformation. Also not in Auschwitz-Birkenau. It's not happening without human beings, but really in the hearts of them. So thank you very much, Christoph, for this evening and giving a kind of a, an insight much. and mm -hmm. also a kind of invitation to come. <laughs>